scientific and practical applications of meditation-based training in sport. The session will dive into the latest research highlighting the significant impact meditation can have on athletic performance, mental resilience, and recovery. Whether you are an athlete, coach, or sports psychologist, we hope this webinar will offer you valuable insights and strategies to optimize both physical and mental performance in a competitive sports arena. My name is Edgar, and I'm pleased to be the moderator of uh, today's session. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Chad Magihi, who currently serves as the Director of Meditation Training at the University of Wisconsin Athletic Department and co-founder of Inner Edge Meditation. Before I hand it over to Chad, I uh, just want to share a quick reminder to all the participants. If you encounter any technical difficulties or issues, please feel free to use the chat tab and our team will be very happy to assist you. Also, you can submit your questions to chat via the questions tab at any point during the presentation. No need to wait until the end. And now, Chad, uh, welcome again. Thank you for being here today, and the floor is all yours. Well, good afternoon to everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're at. Uh, you can tell from my accent that I'm uh, coming in from the United States, where it's morning. Uh, but I want to first start with some gratitude uh, to you, Edgar, and to the team at JCI for facilitating the opportunity to connect today. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and just want to encourage everybody again, uh, as questions come up, submit them right away uh, so that so that they're there, so that we can um, have some good dialogue. So I plan to you know share some information for a little while, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A and conversation. So to begin, uh, I just want to be really clear. I love spending time with high-performing people in high-performing organizations. Uh, very few things bring me more joy than doing that. So the opportunity to be with you all in your various roles and capacities today is thrilling to me. So what I do is I train and I research meditation in high-performance environments. My background is that uh, I've been a meditator 25 years, um, and for uh, many years, six years, I was based at the world leading neuroscience research group investigating mindfulness and meditation called the Center for Healthy Minds at UW Madison. And when I was at this university research group, I didn't know if it was possible to bring rigorous meditation training rooted in contemplative science into elite athletic environments. So we started to explore. It really kicked into gear about seven or eight years ago when there was a guy who played football uh, at the University of Wisconsin and then played professional football in the National Football League. After he retired, he wanted to do something to benefit guys who played the game. Long story short, Chris Borland and I collaborated and created an eight week mindfulness based training for 17 retired NFL players. And we didn't know what would happen. Would these guys think this is a bunch of hippie, dippy, woo woo kind of out there stuff? And that's not what they found. They found it rigorous, they found it beneficial, and they were using it in their own lives. Some of them were still on staff at the Wisconsin Athletic Department, including the head strength coach for the football team, and the Chris McIntosh, who's now our athletic director, and they invited me in to start to share from a contemplative science perspective how this training could show up in their environments. Fast forward to the 2021 Volleyball National Championship. This is a team that I've been training with for two years up until this point. And in this match, we're playing our arch rival, Nebraska. Goes to five sets, and we thought we'd won. The team stormed the floor, hugging, celebrating, and then the Nebraska coach challenged the call. Our team had to return to the sideline, confusion, ambiguity, worry. And they talked about in those moments, using the practices and training for the skills that we'd been preparing for, integrated practices, like feeling their feet on the court, feeling the breath roll in and out, tracking racing thoughts and emotions, so that it allowed them to settle. So then when they took the court again, they did so with a sense of steadiness, a sense of presence, and we were able to win the second national championship point, bringing home the first national championship in program history. Now to be clear, they did not win it because of mindfulness and meditation. They won it because of thousands of hours and dedication and hard work. What the mindfulness and meditation training did was allow them to reliably unleash those potentials in the moments that mattered the most. So I've continued to do this in a range of athletic environments, college sports, professional sports, 
And I also work with tactical athletes. Uh, so this can be in law enforcement or over the past couple of years, most of my time spent with the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, with their mission critical team. So their tier one special forces team and their SWAT teams across the country. Uh, so really interested in what does it look like uh, to bring this rigorous meditation training into the most elite and high performing environments. And it's not just me making this stuff up. Like I said, this is rooted in what we know scientifically about training the mind in these ways. So this is a paper that, as you can see, is in preparation uh, that I'm writing with Josh Rooks and Amici Ja, who are cognitive neuroscientists at the University of Miami. And in this paper, we're pointing to the foundational nature of what we're talking about with mindfulness and meditation training. And we start with an example from uh, physical sport. So in sport, we want athletes physically to be successful. Uh, and we also want them to be mentally successful. Physically, this acronym we're using here is what's important now. And of course, physically, athletes need to always be answering, uh, asking and answering this question. What should they be doing? What's important now? And the way we do that is we do a bunch of practice. We do a bunch of sport specific stuff, whatever that sport may be. And we used to think this was it. If you want to be better at basketball, play more basketball. But of course, now we understand that there's foundational physical capacities that we typically think of as kind of weight room or strength and conditioning strategies that we know are foundational and you have to be engaged in both to be able to perform at your best. Yet with the mind, we haven't made this same transition yet. We still mentally want athletes to do what's important now. We've gotten good at this psychological skills training level. So this could be everything from traditional sports psychology practices like visualization, goal setting, arousal regulation, um, or it could be leadership strategies. We have a lot of quality information here and ways to train, but sometimes we skip over these foundational capacities that mindfulness and meditation training is extremely good at training for. Things like attention, meta-awareness, acceptance, or decentering. What I want you to take from this slide is the foundational nature of what it is that we're talking about today. That it is just going to make you better at what you're already doing at an elite level. One interesting tidbit of science around this foundational level is that uh, we know, the science is clear, that the number one thing that degrades these foundational capacities is stress. And of course you, your athletes, your colleagues are experiencing a tremendous amount of stress and will be in the future. So if we're not training to stabilize these qualities, we should not expect them to be there. But the good news is that we have a lot of evidence and a lot of training to be able to stabilize these qualities. So it all starts with this. It all starts with neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is the simple scientific truth that your brain is built to learn and it's constantly happening. The question is, who's in charge of that process? Do we leave it up to the swirling winds of circumstance or do we take responsibility and train the mind for qualities that we know are important for performance and well-being? When we take responsibility for it, the way we should think about it is as strength and conditioning for the mind. Just like we would never leave physical performance to chance without training for it, we need to think about the mind in the same way. To that end, with the body, we think about it as we're training to get bigger, faster, stronger. With the mind, I think a helpful way to think about it is we're in advance training for the skills to be more focused, more resilient, and be a better teammate. To be clear, I'm not a mental health provider. That's not my job, that's not what I do. I'm a mental performance coach. So what I think about is how do we take folks from good to great and great to elite? So a question that every high performer is asking is what are you doing to separate yourself? So I wanted to bring in a couple of voices from some athletes who've engaged in this training. So this is Jonathan Taylor, football player who played at Wisconsin, is now in the NFL. And he talked about sometimes it can feel like there's so much going on uh, and mindfulness is a chance to tune in with his body and be at his best for what's next. Or applying the techniques that he learned on the daily in particular thinking about the intensity of a workout and then being able to refocus and do that next rep properly and under control. I invite you to think about yourself, your athletes, your colleagues, is this a common issue that you see happening in your environments? And what would the performance differentiators be by integrating this training so that these positive outcomes are there? Or Emma Jaskinick, an all-American soccer player at Wisconsin, a meditator for many years, talked about in the championship match, I was so calm, I knew what I was doing, I was in the moment and I scored the game-winning goal. That's the moment I knew I was meditating forever. So just getting glimpses into some of the athletes who've already found ways to integrate this training to impact their performance. And there's a few key areas that I think meditation can be particularly helpful 
um, when we're thinking about peak performance. And we're gonna dig into each one of these today, but just know that this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's many more areas that we could explore in future talks, workshops, and conversations. But one is distraction. We can only get better in the present. Another is resilience. We have to be able to come back again and again to do what's important now. And injury, our best availability, or our best ability is of course our availability. So we'll dig into each of these a little bit today. So the first is attention. And the obstacle, of course, is distraction. How many times have you, um, in your career, uh, had somebody, whether it was a parent, teacher, coach, tell you to pay attention? Probably thousands of times. And how many times did they teach you how to pay attention? For most of us, never. And that's just not how attention works. Attention is a skill. Attention is a skill that has to be trained. But there's some foundational ways that attention works that we need to understand so that we can uh, effectively train with it. And one of them is, and they've done this amazing science, experience sampling science, uh, where they find that people's mind is wandering 47% of the time. So roughly half the time, we're not paying attention to what we're doing. I mean, I'd like to think even that what I've been talking about for the past few minutes has been so interesting that each of you has stuck with me every second of the way. And that has not happened for any of you. You've wandered out of this call. You've thought about something that's happening later, something from earlier, got pulled into something else on your screen. And it's not a problem when that happens. We want to notice that mind wandering. Sometimes it can be helpful. Creativity insights can happen, but sometimes it's not helpful. And we need to be able to unhook and reset our attention. The last finding on attention is that when we're paying attention to what we're doing, we're happier. It just feels good, uh, which is rather intuitive, uh, but also another uh, kind of performance and well-being reason uh, that training attention is so important. And the results are clear. So in this slide, what we're seeing is baseline and then after uh, meditation training. So this, in this image, you can see in this area, in these frontal lobes, front part of the brain, uh, before the training and then after the training. After the training, there's just more activity in these areas. We're literally rewiring the brain when we engage in these practices. So just like if you, you know, put somebody in the weight room, they're going to develop larger muscle groups in the same way we're developing larger mental muscle groups when we're engaged in this training. This is one of the huge gifts of a research group like the Center for Early Minds is we're seeing the neural correlates of what happens when we train the mind in these specific ways. And at the end of the day, attention is the currency of performance. So I wanted to just take a moment and just do a quick practice. And of course, in a setting like this, one of the challenges I have is what practice do I choose to do? Because uh, there's so many different types of meditation practice that we can do. But I wanted to do one today that's pretty foundational that some of you may have some experience with. So first off, your posture can be anything. You can be seated, standing, lying down, whatever's comfortable for you. What matters is that you find a balance that, or a posture that feels uh, relaxed and alert. Your eyes can be open or closed. And just begin by bringing some attention to your feet. Feeling your feet on the floor. Feeling your body in the chair. Feeling your shoulders, your jaw. Checking with your breath. You don't have to go get the breath. The breath is already here. Your attention fall back onto the natural rhythm of your breathing. If it hasn't happened already, it will happen that the mind will wander off. Future, past, end of thinking. It's not a problem. The moment you notice attention has wandered off, that is a moment of mindfulness. It's a moment where there's some space, and in that space, you can choose what to do with your attention. You can choose to go with the thinking if it's helpful, or you can choose to unhook and come back to the immediacy of this breath as it moves in and out of your body. As we come to the end of this practice, just taking a moment to notice how things are for you in your mind, in your body. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's just information, it's just data about what's happening. 
If your eyes were closed, feel free to open them. Move your body anyway. That's helpful. So I think one of the things that's really important in this style of training, and frankly, in any style of learning from my perspective, is that after we have an experience, and we just did a little bit of practice together as an experience, it's important that we take some time to reflect on that. And the result of that is going to be learning. And it's a sort of learning that's applied to us specifically, and with quality facilitation and inquiry uh, from an expert trainer that can be highly developed skills to allow us to get better. So a few questions for us to consider now, by nature of the webinar, it's going to be hard to exchange, but I want to offer what this process looks like. So what did you notice? I'm sure some of you notice your mind wandered. Not a problem. Every time you notice your attention wander off and come back, we should think about that as a rep. Your attention is actually getting stronger every time you bring it back. You can't be bad at meditation from your mind wandering. That's a big misconception. Your mind's going to produce thoughts like your lungs are going to breathe. What you're doing is noticing that, but choosing. Do you want to go with it or do you want to come back? Or what might the benefits be if you were to integrate this or if you have integrated this? And this can be a huge range. This can go from recovery to help so folks uh, support, you know, after a training period or sleep. Um, or this can be something to work with, you know, pre-performance nerves. Or there's baseline changes that happen when we engage in this practice every day that can support more steadiness, more concentration, more stability throughout our daily life. And then when? When could you apply this? What does this look like? It could be in the morning to start your day, end of the day to wind things down before a training session, after a training session. And then there's many integrated practices, uh, such as box breathing or tactical breathing, that we can do to integrate this into the flow of our activities. So we're gonna keep moving on here, but I just wanna give a taste of what the training looks like as we start to integrate it into our performance environments. So moving into our second area of resilience. And I'm sure we all agree with this quote that it's not your, uh, the adversity itself, it's how we react to it that determines how our life story will develop. So what does meditation have to say about this? What's the unique contribution? So to begin, I wanted to share some really fascinating research that came from our group at the Center for Healthy Minds. And what we're looking at here is first two groups of meditators, uh, long-term meditators and non-meditators, so those with lots of practice experience and those with low practice experience. And in this study, we had them in the fMRI. So we had them in the brain scanner. And in this scanner, we were looking at the part of their brain that's responsible for perception of pain. And the study design was this. You can see on the bottom that they would hear a sound, a tone, kind of a neutral tone. And then a few moments later, they had a heat shock. Everyone had a band on their wrist and really hot water just below the level of burning would come through that band. So a negative stimulus. So let's see what happened. So you can see here, uh, these are the long-term meditators, and they begin with the activity in this pain network, uh, not a lot of activity. And then the sound happens and that activity level stays the same. And then that negative stimulus comes, shoots way up. That negative stimulus is there for a moment or two and then it's gone, comes back down to baseline. Now we're gonna take a look at the non-meditators. So no practice experience. So they start similarly, there's not a lot of activity in this pain network and then they hear the sound. And what do you think happens? You're right shoots way up, just hearing the sound. Negative stimulus hasn't arrived yet. And then the negative stimulus does arrive. That heat shock is there. That heat shock is there for a moment or two, and then it's gone. And what do you think happens? Exactly. It stays elevated for a really long time. So I think this is pretty compelling research. When I saw this, I immediately thought of athletes. How many times uh, do, does an athlete experience some level of stress or adversity? All the time, whether it's a turnover, a missed play, things from their personal life. Does the, you know, does the match stop? Does the game stop just because an athlete experienced adversity? No, it continues. So the question is, how's that athlete gonna perform if they're here or if they're here completely differently? So the question isn't how do we get rid of every difficulty in our life? We're not trying to be gluttons for punishment, but a really important question becomes, what are we doing to train the mind to come back down to baseline more quickly? And we need a good answer to that question. Because both this activity before, what you know, could be you know, pre-performance anxiety or, or whatever that may be, or this activity after is optional for the trained mind. We do not have to participate in it. Uh, but the only way to get that is by training. So there's more to explore in this slide, but I wanted to share a little bit of it, kind of pique some interest on what some of the benefits could be. 
So what does this look like as we continue to do some research uh, with University of Wisconsin athletes? So in this study, this was after a foundational training. So a six session training that we did with the team. And in this group, we had two groups, the control group. So these are teams that didn't do the training and then the group that did do the training. And what we're seeing here is um, two measures. So we have PCS, which is physical composite score, and then we'll look at MCS, mental composite score. So in the physical composite score, you can see that there's no change over time. Even though the, the two groups start at different levels, uh, the, they're not statistically significant. And so what we're looking at is that there's no change over time in their physical composite score in this training, which makes some sense. These athletes physically got better. This is over the course of three or four months. In the mental composite score, we see something dramatically different. We see that the group that didn't engage in the training, their mental composite score went way down, and the group that did engage in the training, their mental composite score went way up. One of the ways that I think we can interpret these data are that we can engage in physically really hard things, but not at the expense of our mental composite score or our mental gain. And think about the, compound, the compounding advantages of stacking this day after day, week after week, month after month. Uh, that's gonna outpace competition. Bring in a couple more voices as we're moving along here. So this is Dana Retke. So Dana Retke, uh, volleyball player at Wisconsin, now playing professionally in Italy, talked about in tight situations, I'm usually the one who wants the ball. I consider myself pretty mentally strong. I thought that just kind of happened. But by training together, she learned how to get herself there. So we're not leaving this training of the mind to chance. For Keanu Benton, an American football player, talked about a mindfulness has really helped him slow things down to be that person that he is without all the stress. And again, for our athletes, for us, there's so much stress, so much ambiguity, so much change that's constantly happening that if we're not training to have a way to have stability and presence in the midst of that, then we should expect to be sucked into that storm. Uh, but we don't have to do that. We can train to be uh, okay in the midst of constantly changing circumstances. Okay, the last area that I wanted to share with you all uh, is around injury. So I think these are some really exciting findings that we just published this winter. Uh, and in these findings, what we're looking at um, is we had um, the strength coach for this team uh, was asking strength coach questions. So physically, how are athletes doing? And that it helped him and the coaches inform their programming. And then he started to ask, did you do a mindfulness practice this day? So we're able to look at and see, is there a relationship between doing a mindfulness practice and physical uh, outcomes for athletes? So we had two main findings. So the first main finding was uh, on the days, so this is the same day, on the same day that the athletes did a mindfulness practice, they had significantly better mood, energy level, muscle readiness, and readiness to train. I think we should think about these as kind of foundational performance factors. As these go down, so do does performance, as does well-being. And as these go up, so too does performance and well-being. And typically in high-performance environments, we are training really hard and we expect these things to go down. Uh, and these data are showing that we can actually see the opposite happen, that we can tick these in the other direction with regular practice. And that's a huge caveat. Like we're not sitting around waiting for problems to happen in this paradigm. Contemplative science is really clear that we need to train for these things in advance. It needs to become a regular part of our overall training. And then the second finding uh, is we looked at sports medicine data. So we looked at injury data. And these are the day after doing a mindfulness practice. So the day after these athletes did a mindfulness practice, they had a, a reduction in the incidence of acute injury by 58%. So this is a massive number. And honestly, I think this is the sort of number that has the capacity to change the way that sport is trained forever. Because what athlete, what coach is not going to be interested in reducing the incidence of injury? So a couple of caveats around this number. As we continue to grow the research, we get bigger sample sizes, do randomized control trials. Um, as we do this across sports, these data come from a non-contact sport. So as we do it in football, soccer, hockey, uh, this number is going to come down. But whatever this number lands at is still a meaningful way to engage in this training if we're only interested in reducing the incidence of injury. And of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but a pretty profound one that I think for our athletic trainers, sports medicine, strength coaches, sport coaches, athletes, anyone who's interested in maximizing performance, uh, needs to be paying attention to these findings. So starting to 
kind of wind us down from, from me talking and kind of open this up a little bit, hopefully it's become pretty clear the foundational way that this training operates. That whether it's attention or whether it's training for resilience or whether it's training uh, to reduce injury, these are all foundational capacities that allow you, your athletes, to continue to perform at ever increasing higher levels. It just makes you better at what you're already doing. And hopefully it's become quite clear that meditation isn't just training the mind. This is a misconception that happens. Uh, and of course, meditation begins at its starting place that the mind and the body is one system. Uh, and the benefits are going to show up across that system, whether it's brain, body, or health, including what we talked about today. We saw that distraction is a huge obstacle. Uh, and if we're not able to train attention to be where we want it to be, our performance is going to be negatively impacted. And it's clear, the science is overwhelmingly clear that we can train the mind to spend more time in the present moment, but we have to train for it. Or resilience. It's become clear that if we don't train the mind in specific ways, we will get caught up in swirling thinking about the way we think the world is. Some of that thinking may be helpful, but a lot of it isn't helpful. So we need to be able to discern and unhook from those unhelpful beliefs, unhelpful stories and thoughts, and let go of them so that we can attach to ones that are more helpful, ultimately in service of doing what's important now. And of course, the injury data. Uh, we need to do everything we can, whether it's from nutrition, training, uh, and as we're seeing here from a meditation perspective to decrease the likelihood of injury. So I wanna leave you with this notion. Uh, that, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, elite athletes just weren't lifting weights. They thought it would make them bulky, heavy, wear their bodies out. And then, of course, some science started to point to the benefits of the training. Some athletes started to do it. And now strength and conditioning is a completely integrated part of overall sport performance at every level. I think what we're talking about today is going to be on a similar trajectory, that meditation-based strength and conditioning for the mind has some evidence that's pointing to the benefits of it. Some uh, groups and athletes are starting to engage in this training, like Mumajan Mehta, starting middle linebacker for the Wisconsin Badgers these past few years, now a professional player for the Cincinnati Bengals, who's also a five-year meditator. He's gonna be the norm of what it takes to be able to accomplish what an athlete or an athletic organization wants to accomplish. So that whatever your goal is, individual, team, or even in your personal life or in your business life, I think there's a really strong case to be made that you're going to want to include meditation as you go after your goals. And if you have a picture of yourself with a, a national championship trophy of a team you supported, you have to include it in your presentation. Those are the rules, not my rules. Those are the rules. So my question to you is, what's your plan? There's an amazing um, author um, who I really uh, enjoy reading from who put it this way. Suppose you read about a pill that you could take once a day to reduce anxiety and increase contentment. Would you take it? Most of us probably, yeah. Plus further, this pill had a great variety of side effects and then all of them good. Increased self-esteem, empathy, trust, even improves memory. Suppose finally that pill is natural, costs you nothing. Now are you interested? Most of us are kind of chomping at the bit. Well, that pill exists and it's meditation. And we've pointed to some of the ways that meditation, especially in a sport context, can provide some of these benefits. But in a low cost, easy to integrate way, there's lots of advantages that can come. But it's important that we look at the roots of this. And again, where I'm coming from is from a contemplative science perspective. Uh, and there's crossover and similarities between the way contemplative science approaches uh, mindfulness and meditation in the way traditional sport and exercise performance psychology has. So there's lots of rich exploration and learning that's ahead of us in these areas. But for you, what did you learn today about meditation training that can help you achieve your goals? Hopefully some ideas, some nuggets. And then what are you going to do? A webinar like this can be great for learning. Uh, it can be great for increasing your exposure to something. But if we want to benefit from the training, we have to engage in the training. So I invite each of you to think, what's something you're going to do? Maybe that's reach out to somebody. Maybe that's start again, a meditation practice that you've lost in the past. Maybe that's do a little bit more learning, download an app. But what are you going to do to start to actually experience these benefits in your life? Because at the end of the day, meditation training is a competitive advantage. So today we explored some of the ways for you all and your various connections to JCI it could be a competitive advantage. But without a doubt, this is going to be a differentiator for athletes moving forward. 
So we'll open it up here in a moment, but I did want to offer if folks want to stay connected um, virtually, uh, would love to do that, whether that's you know, Instagram or LinkedIn, uh, try to share information that I think is relevant from a research or training perspective here. And, and of course, would love to be connected with others who are interested in what can we do collectively with our various expertise uh, to move things forward to increase performance and well being uh, for ourselves and for the athletes and coaches that we have the amazing fortune to work with. So I will pause there. Um, and then, Edgar, if you want to come back on and we'll kind of open things up a little bit. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chad, for such a great presentation. I have to admit that I'm also new in this uh, area for sure. And, uh, very interesting, very interesting. Um, I'm gonna read some questions from the audience, if you're okay with it, okay? Maybe you already you already reply some of them, but uh, I, I think a good refresh of some of the answers would be, would be very good, right? So, um, yes. Um, Abdel Hamid uh, asked if, can you share practical examples of balancing these practices for optimal performance gain? Yes, absolutely. Um, first, let me stop sharing. Um, don't need people don't need to see these QR codes forever. Okay. Um, so, uh, kind of practical examples of what this looks like for for optimal performance. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, one is thinking about this from a, what I call a base training perspective. Uh, so this would be kind of like the regular way that we're um, training for these practices. So the physical corollary would be like getting in the squat rack. Uh, we get in the squat rack regularly to develop muscle groups that show up in performance. So we need to regularly engage in this training if we want them to show up in performance. And one of the ways that looks is we actually tie it on to physical training. So after a training session, and that could be an on court, you know, on field, training session and that could be an in the weight room training session um sometimes before uh an athlete uh starts that warm-up we'll as a team do a training and then they do the dynamic warm-up together or we'll do it at the end of that practice after they finish their workout finish their training period do kind of their cool down then collectively we'll do a practice together i think it's important at different times because for different athletes they're gonna have preferences on what are the timing that they like to do it but that's an easy way to uh, kind of practically implement it into a training environment but of course that requires collaboration with other performance staff and kind of understanding from them so there's a lot that goes into uh, pulling off something like that but can be quite effective uh, in normalizing this training and, and really increasing adaptation Excellent, thank you. Um, another question is from uh, Ross. Yes, how does the self-regulation theory relate to this? Uh, he or she said that uh, I can see some overlap here. Yeah, so this is a, a great question. I mean, I would want to get into like which, um, like where this person, like the self-regulation theory that they're discussing. Um, but I think, you know, I think one of the overlap areas in my understanding uh, would be uh, that uh, self-awareness and self-regulation are foundational to performance and that we need to have them in order to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Uh, what I think an interesting thing that meditation takes as a central aim, especially the mindfulness part of meditation, is how do we cultivate the capacities for self-awareness. How do we cultivate the capacities to have stability to observe emotions as they're happening, thoughts as they're happening, awareness of somatic experience as it's happening, uh, and to be able to observe that in the moment, especially during periods of intensity, of strong emotion, of strong automatic thinking. Uh, it's not good enough to just say that self-awareness is important, uh, we need to be able to train for it. And I think um, the mindfulness aspect of meditation training in particular, uh, the scientific evidence and the applied experience of it is a really profound way for athletes to be able to develop those capacities um, and, and grow in those capacities over time. Thank you, Chad. Um, a question from Riley. What does meditation training look like for the athletes you work with? 
Yeah. So it, it looks a lot of different ways, as as you can imagine, um, in in the same way that physical training can look a lot of different ways. So one of the models that I think can be really helpful as we think about what does rigorous meditation training look like, uh, again, comes from what I've talked about or mentioned a few times uh, during this webinar uh, from the contemplative sciences. Uh, and a model um, from my colleagues at the Center for Healthy Minds that they refer to as the Healthy Minds model. And in the Healthy Minds model, they have four key uh, modules or four key elements of a healthy mind. Awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. So at one level, it's kind of pulling from all of these different areas to inform what programming looks like for an athlete. Uh, on a more granular level, when I'm choosing what to do with an athlete or with a team, that happens in conversation. That happens in conversation with strength coaches. That happens in conversations with sport coaches. I'm not working isolated with a particular athlete or with a particular team. So we want to meet the context demands, especially in season for what's happening for that person or individual. Uh, and then out of season, we can do a lot more foundational work to develop those skills. So that might have been a little bit of a non-answer to your question. Um, we can get into the weeds a little bit more. Uh, but those are some of the kind of conceptual pieces that go into, you know, how, how I make decisions on what training program looks like. Great. Thank you, Chad. Um, yes, uh, Hashim. Hey, Hashim. He says, uh, thanks, Chad, for the presentation. As a CrossFit competitor, what would you suggest meditating during competition day, especially since it's it is recommended in CrossFit not to hit the competition floor, relax it, cold, or with low heart rate. Yeah, great question. Love it. Um, so what I would encourage, you know, this uh, CrossFit athlete to do is don't wait until competition day to start to explore how you can integrate meditation practice. Uh, start during training. Uh, so before a training session, uh, do a practice. Um, and try a bunch of different types of practice. Like I mentioned during the webinar, we, I, I, I had to choose one type of practice to do today. There's so many types of practice, including movement practices. I think that can be a misconception that folks think they need to be kind of sitting still to do these practices. No, we can be moving. And um, in fact, a lot of athletes uh, do movement practices integrated into their dynamic warm up. Uh, and so I think there's lots of ways to explore and different styles of practice that one can do. Uh, but I would encourage, you know, in this CrossFit fit example, but for anybody athlete to start exploring and training and see what happens. So that by the time competition day rolls around, uh, there's lots of experience to inform uh, what's going to be the most effective way uh, to engage. And then as best you can, there can be a self um, kind of referential process to explore the impacts uh, and then, of course, working with somebody who has more experience to be able to support you can really catalyze that process as well. A question from Tabu. Um, how can we start teaching our mindfulness skills to, you, to youth athletes? How many times a week type of techniques? I think this is more, more operational <laughs> question. Totally. Um, so the first thing, um, if anybody wants to teach mindfulness to somebody else, is that person must invest in their own personal practice. Mindfulness is not just a bunch of ideas uh, or concepts. It's an embodied practice. And the embodiment of that practice takes time. It takes the individual who's training in those skills to invest in their own personal practice. So that's first and foremost, like we need to take the time ourselves to be able to do that. And there's good, you know, literature out of contemplative science that supports this approach. With that being said, on a more kind of like assuming that that is in place, like what does it actually look like from an operational level? Um, I would start small. I would start, you know, depending on training frequency, right? Like, so let's imagine somebody is you know training with athletes four times a week just to give us a starting place uh then i would say for that person to start uh one one day a week do something whether it's pre-training in the middle of training uh post-training um and then see how that goes and then slowly build up over time i don't think we want to force this too heavy too quickly we want to experience the benefits and then slowly continue to develop them 
over time. Um, so yeah, that would be my main advice, kind of off off the jump. Just start small, um, and then you know, kind of build progressively over time. Great, Chad. Um, yes, I'm not sure if it is really related to this topic, but I wanted to ask if uh, does, for example, gratitude or appreciation fit into meditation training? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it absolutely does. Um, and I think this is an area where sometimes folks can get a misunderstanding of what mindfulness and meditation training is. Uh, the most widely known parts of meditation training is the mindfulness component, which has to do with attention, has to do with presence, has to do with observing thinking. And those are really powerful uh, in and of themselves. And, and those are foundational to every other part of contemplative practice and what contemplative sciences are exploring. But it's not just limited there. Uh, there's uh, a whole other wings of practice. And one of those models is what I mentioned before, the healthy minds model. Um, but other kind of from more traditional kind of uh, these practices historically have been rooted in Buddhism. And there, there's clearly two wings of practice. There's awareness practices kind of what's happening in my mind and my body uh, externally and understanding that as it's happening. But then there's more what we might consider connection practices or compassion or kind of those style of practices. And appreciation and gratitude are an extremely powerful part of that practice. So to just build a little bit more on this, operationally, the way we define appreciation scientifically is noticing the good that is already there. So it's not pretending things are good when they're not not denying difficulty. I would argue that uh, a mindfulness practice allows us to be with difficulty, with stability, but our human minds have a tendency to notice negative things. There's a negativity bias that we all have. So if we're not intentionally training the mind to notice good things, we'll miss them. And from a performance perspective, that's a big problem. Uh, first and foremost, we need to have a clear understanding of what's happening in performance the challenges as well as the good things if we want to get better. And then of course, if our only way of motivating and getting better is to notice what's wrong, eventually that's going to burn dirty uh, and motivation is going to be severely impacted. So we need to have authentic, realistic ways of noticing the good things that are happening. So appreciation, gratitude, um, I think is a, a powerful player uh, in how meditation training can support performance um, and of course, well-being also. Brilliant. Uh, another question that I have personally in this case is that, uh, uh, yes, we heard a lot of, of great inputs and insights about um, elite athletes and high performance. But uh, for example, this meditation training techniques, it, it could also be, uh, you know, applied to, uh, I mean, for regular people or, or not high performance athletes, like maybe just like me, I wanted to run or play football or, or, or you know, a lot of busy work, for example, this could be applied to this kind of profiles as well. Absolutely. Um, so as a non elite athlete myself, uh, you know, I enjoy, you know, being active, right, you know, and playing sports and, you know, all of that. Um, so I think we can use this in ourselves and our own athletic pursuits. But one of the things that I think is, is you're pointing to Edgar that I think is really brilliant is, um, Meditation, all it is, is training the mind. That's it. And our mind is always with us wherever we go. And so for some of us, that may mean we're elite athletes trying to maximize potential at the highest ends of the game. And for others, uh, we're concerned about maybe being the best professional we can, but also being the best parent we can, being the best partner that we can. And so these skills of attention, of noticing the good, of resilience, um, are foundational skills that can support us across domains. So the sciencey way of saying that is meditation training uh, is domain general, not domain specific. It doesn't just show up in one area. We can apply it more specifically in one area, and there's benefit of dialing that in for specific populations, whether it's elite athletes or elite corporate or dads or whoever it is, but there is something about it that's just, this is training the mind to navigate the human experience. Excellent, thanks. And, and 
what would be, for example, the, the first step to, to move forward if you want to, uh, you know, increase our capacity to, to meditate, and go to another level, for say? Absolutely. Um, so there's, there's a lot of options. Um, and so I think there's, you know, we can do it from a training perspective, or we can do it from a learning perspective. And both of them are good options. So if some people on the call may say, well, this is really interesting. And I'd like to understand it more, right? I'd like to read about it, maybe read some of the science about it, or kind of read more kind of practical applications about it. And that learning part maybe is, is foremost for some people, and that can be great. Um, and I'm happy to provide resources along the lines of what I think are quality to be able to do that. And then another is on the training side of things. Like people are like, all right, I get it. What do I do, right? Like, how do I move this forward? Um, and again, there's different ways of engaging the training itself. So there's some really high quality apps out there, Headspace, Calm. I personally like the Healthy Minds program. It's a science-based uh, way of integrating these practices. Um, but whatever method on the training side that someone approaches, I would encourage that person to come up with a plan, just like you come up with a workout plan. You got a sense of, all right, this week I'm going to, you know, lift once. I'm going to, you know, uh, do CrossFit once. I mean, nobody probably has a workout plan like that, but we've got a plan of whatever it is that we're going to do, right? Um, and uh, so similarly, I would encourage you to come up with a plan. All right, I'm going to do a body scan two nights this week before I go to sleep. I'm going to do, you know, an integrated during my dynamic warm up twice before my workout this week. So just kind of come up with a plan and then work the plan. And then you'll get data from yourself that you can continue to adjust as you move forward week to week, month to month. And then, of course, reach out to somebody who can help you do it, whether that's reaching out to you know, somebody like me or somebody else who has experience integrating meditation training uh, you know, into folks like this. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, yes, I think there's no longer a question from the audience. Uh, if there is any final comments, uh, suggestions, recommendations, or anything that you want to share with us, uh, very welcome, Ted. This is your time again. Thank you, Edgar. Yeah, I would encourage folks um, to, to take one thing from this call that you're going to act on uh, so that it's not just left as an interesting learning experience, but there's some thread that continues to be beneficial. And if there's things that I can do to support that, reach out to me, whether it's on the you know, social channels that I shared or, or you can contact me via inneredgemeditation.com um, and figure out what are the ways that we can bring this forward. And ultimately, while meditation may seem uh, a pursuit that is oriented at ourselves and kind of improving ourselves, I would argue that meditation is an unbelievable act of compassion. By training our minds in these ways, we show up to be better for those around us, whether that's our colleagues, athletes we work with, our family members, community members. Uh, so I'd like to leave you with that. Yes, you will benefit from being engaged in this training, but so will so many people around you, some of them known and some of them unknown. Uh, and I think that can be a really motivational way as we go into this uh, training moving forward. Fantastic. Chad, thank you very, very much for your time and the valuable insights you've shared with us today. Pleasure. Thank you, Edgar. Thanks to the team at JCI. And a big thank you as well to our audience for participating. You will soon receive a link to the recording so you can rewatch the session at your convenience. We'll be back soon with more sessions and we invite you as well to stay connected through our social media channels. Have a great day and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye bye.